Okay, well, good morning, everyone. Good to see everybody this morning on this uh, chilly, overcast Sabbath morning. Uh, got some bad weather coming in, so uh, questionable hopefully, weather. questionable. Yes, yeah, so hopefully the power will uh, will stay on through our time together. Great to have you joining us online if you're with us, and we are going to be continuing our story and our studies in the book of Revelation. We've been going through there just <clears throat> chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and looking at some, maybe a more contemporary view of things and ultimate understanding. But before we begin, let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, we want to thank you so much for preserving us throughout the night, as only you can do. For watching over us throughout the week. You're with us in the good times and in the bad. You uh, are concerned about all the facets of our lives and what we can become for you. And so we pray and ask that as we come together and open your book, that your spirit will be here to guide and direct, to inspire us, to teach us, to help us to be more like you. That that the world might be convicted and convinced that there is a God of love in heaven, <clears throat> God of love in heaven that, that uh, paid an ultimate price to provide salvation for humanity. So Father, use us in a significant way to reach other hearts and lives that your name might be glorified. And we ask these things in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen and amen. Okay, so I think we're on the last chapter of uh, our book by, uh, it's uh, Roger Morneau's testimony, right? Dan and Susan said to tell you they got heavy snow up there, so we feel really good that we don't. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I imagine so. I heard they were getting dumped on. North of the border. So we're in the last chapter? In the last chapter of the book. It's called A Ministry of Reconciliation. The account of my trip into the supernatural is now ended, but please don't close the book. I want you to become a blessing in the lives of a great number of people. You may say, I am too busy to get involved in anything that will demand more of my time. I have too many demands placed on me as it is. So I sympathize with you and believe you. It's because you are an active, involved, and industrious person that I am appealing to you. I wish to interest you in a prayer ministry. By having been from Satan's altar to God's mercy seat has given me a unique insight into the supernatural. Understanding the modes of operation by which demon spirits have been so very successful in separating humans from their creator and causing poor mortals to destroy themselves and others with them causes me to believe that all who are members of the family of God should dedicate themselves to carrying on a special ministry for one's fellow humans oppressed by demon spirits. Sad to say, but the majority of Christians are unaware of the great extent to which that spirit oppression is carried even when they are struggling with it in their own homes. I am thinking of the importance of placing sinners, the hopeless, the undeserving, the oppressed, in a position of freedom from the oppression of demon spirits, where they can make intelligent decisions regarding their well-being in this present life and for eternity. As Christian travelers passing through the land of the enemy, you and I have capacities or rights that no one else can exercise, not even angels in heaven. And God wants, us, wants to make us channels for the outworking of the greatest force in the universe, the operation of the Spirit of God on behalf of perishing human beings. We are called to work along with Jesus in restoring poor mortals to God's righteousness, and in so doing, enable them to obtain eternal life, which our Heavenly Father is so freely offering to them. We should become involved in a special prayer ministry. Relief for the oppressed comes through prayer that are specific in nature. Too many Christians pray generally, and because of that, never see their prayers answered before their eyes. I have practiced what I am telling you for many years, and to illustrate how it has worked for me in blessing the lives of others, I wish to recount a few instances in which the power of the Spirit of God rebuked the power of demon spirits operating in the lives of helpless humans and brought them to the sweet peace of God's love. It was late in April 1972, and I was driving home from my week's activities in telephone directory work. I decided to stop in Watertown, New York to pick up a couple of items needed. 
Having driven to the parking lot of the F.W. Woolworth store, that's a name we haven't heard in a long time, I went in, bought what I had to get, and returning to my car, decided to take a few minutes and process the paperwork that had to be done sooner or later. It was a great day in that the temperature had reached into the high 70s, and a gentle breeze seemed to revive nature with promises yes, of yet greater and better things to come. Um, well, Larry just said it's not on Roku right now. It should be. Mom says it should be, but... Has he got the channel hmm? just installed? Did he get the channel installed? <clears throat> You have the channel installed. Right. Getting into my car, I quickly opened the windows to release that superheated air that proved uncomfortable to sit in. And a few minutes later, a green Mercury automobile pulled in two parking spaces away from where I was. Peeking from the corner of my eye, I saw a middle-aged couple with the woman at the steering wheel. As I continued working on my papers, I was shocked into prayer. A conversation took place between the two individuals that went like this. Mary, you will have to start the car so I can put up the power window. Jim, you are stupid. I've told you a hundred times the windows have to be put up while the motor is running. Won't you ever learn? The man then opened up and brought out a mixture of the sacred and profane to get, off, get, get attention to his wife that her words had hit a sensitive spot in his brain. He was getting very angry, accusing her of being instrumental in wrecking what had begun as a perfect day for him by refusing to keep her mouth shut. Instantly my mind was transported back to 1946 to a statement made by the old satanic priest that demon spirits delight in stirring up human emotions to heights sufficient to create anger or hatred capable of murder. Immediately within myself I cried to my great high priest in the holy of holies of the heavenly sanctuary Dear Jesus, please forgive the iniquities and sins of these, my fellow travelers, and by the mighty power of the Holy Spirit, rebuke the demon spirits that are oppressing their minds, and bless their lives with the sweet peace of thy love. Suddenly, the verbal storm stopped, and the sea of life became perfectly still for those two precious souls. For about one minute, not a word was spoken. Then the man broke the silence by saying, Mary, I'm sorry I got so angry. Really, I feel bad now that I spoke to you the way I did. I don't know why I get so angry. I can actually feel hatred mount up in me toward people I dearly love. And then it was beautiful to hear the woman admit that she was at fault to a great extent and that she was not careful with her words and at times actually took pleasure in jabbing him with pointed words. Promising to be more considerate in the future, she gave him a kiss on the cheek and they both got out of the car after putting the windows up. Stepping to the parking meter, the husband looked at his change to feed the meter. And having no dime or nickel, he turned to his wife, saying, Sugar Plum, would you be so kind enough to look in your purse for some change? How can I refuse when you are treating me like a lady? You realize, Jim, you haven't called me your Sugar Plum since the kids were little. Sure. After he deposited the coins in the meter, she grabbed him by the arm, and like two lovers, they proceeded to go in and do some shopping. Sitting in my car, I had the surprise of my life, and a new dimension had been added to my Christian experience. Never before had I asked the Lord to forgive someone's sins. I had given the matter some thought, but that was as far as it had gone. And as I said a short while ago, I was shocked into that prayer. When the verbal abuses started to fly, I discerned demon spirits at work oppressing the minds of those people. And as the sacred and profane were brought forth, I realized the man probably hadn't had his sins forgiven in 20 years. <laughs> Knowing that sin separates God and man, I sensed the urgency of the moment and took action in asking the Lord for the grace I was sure to bring those individuals the deliverance they needed and the peace of God to bless their lives. As I continued reflecting on the incident, I discerned that the demon spirit's game of mind depression had been brought to a stop by the mighty power of the Spirit of God breaking the forces of the enemy, leaving the couple surrounded with the atmosphere of heaven and, in reality, an ideal situation for anyone to find themselves in. I was amazed to see how quickly and how different the individual's outlook on life became when they found themselves under the relaxing light of heavenly grace. And I had been instrumental in opening the way so that the Lord Jesus could benefit their lives as he did. Also, that great change had taken place without my having opened my mouth or getting on my knees. How practical a ministry, I thought. I was impressed. What a mighty power. 
and what a mighty Redeemer we have in the person of the Lord Jesus. Was not this type of problem solving carried out by our Lord while on earth, I thought? Of course it was. To the paralytic who was hoping for physical healing, Jesus said, Thy sins are forgiven thee. First the Lord removed from the helpless man his burden of sin, and then did the next important thing, he healed him. Also at Simon's house, when the woman seeking peace for her soul anointed the master's feet with precious ointment, Jesus said to her, Thy sins are forgiven, thy faith has saved thee, go in peace. From that moment on, my Christian experience was to become a joy and a blessing. A joy seeing my prayers answered before my eyes by the mighty power of the Spirit of God, rebuking demon spirits from oppressing the minds of poor mortals, and my becoming a gift bearer or blessing to the sinner, to the helpless, the undeserving, through intercessory prayer, making available to them the sweet peace of God's love. So I there and then de dedicated my life to being a peacemaker. Blessed are the peacemakers, Jesus said, for they shall be called the children of God. <laughs> There's Jerry's t-shirt. I was wearing that shirt last week. What? I thought I was wearing that shirt last week. Your chapter yeah, that takes turns things. Uh, heavenly peace is a gift of great value and lacking exceedingly in the lives of modern humans. Our Lord placed great emphasis on the value of peace as relating to the well-being of humans. Just before his crucifixion, he said to his disciples, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. And after his resurrection, his very first words to them in the upper room were, Peace be unto you. The Apostle Paul declared the gospel of the Lord Jesus to be a gospel of peace. And above all, Christ Jesus is proclaimed as being our peace in Ephesians 2. So Christian friends, I ask you to make your presence felt wherever you find yourselves. Be a bearer of the gift of peace to fellow mortals in this demon-agitated and trouble-filled world. Place those with whom you come in contact under a heavenly atmosphere of light and peace. Demon spirits can't abide there, and as a result, the individuals will find peace and rest for their souls. Bring those that labor and are heavy laden to where Christ Jesus will give them rest. Here's a short illustration. Business pressures were found to be demon-imposed pressures. Working on a telephone directory for about a month, I was not really concerned when told by the manager of a large building supply firm that it would be difficult for me to talk to the owner. I had a lot of time to work with and figured if I came in two or three times a week, I would find the man free to talk over his advertising program one of those days. But things didn't work out the way I had planned, and as I talked to the manager on Monday of that last week, I realized I was facing an unusual situation. The boss was in, but in a bad mood. Too many things to attend to. The manager suggested that I call again the next day. I, in turn, asked for him to get a definite appointment to see the man, or he could be left without advertising in the telephone directory for the coming year. He managed to get me a definite time, 10 a.m. Wednesday morning. Returning to keep my appointment that morning, I found myself arriving 15 minutes early. It was a beautiful day, and up to then, all had gone well. Entering the establishment, I found it to be a beehive of activity. Seeing the manager from a distance, I made my way to the counter where he was serving a customer. When a few feet away, he said good morning, and I returned the salutation. He then asked the clerk to finish serving his customer, and we proceeded to walk up to the owner's office. His first words were that I was most unfortunate coming to see the boss that day. It seemed that on the days I had come to see the man, something very upsetting had taken place and distressed him. This morning, he said, Joe must have gotten up on the wrong side of the bed as he came in with a somber-looking face. A short while later, he got word that a shipment we had been expecting today was delayed because of unexpected circumstances. So if the boss shouts at you, don't pay attention to him. His distresses are probably the price he has to pay for being wealthy. Arriving at the glassed-in office, the manager opened the door and told the owner, the Yellow Pages man is here to keep the appointment I arranged with you last Monday. Come on in, but you'll have to wait till I get a phone call completed that I have to make right now. I don't know why, but some of you guys pick the worst time to call on me. <laughs> no problem, sir, I can wait. Take your time, was my reply. Sitting down, I realized the man was operating on high voltage. He appeared to be a chain smoker as his office was filled with cigarette smoke the ashtray overflowing with cigarette butts, and he had one in his hand. The tone of his conversation was loaded with outbursts of dissatisfaction toward the person he was talking to. 
On the wall was a plaque with an interesting and appropriate little saying, which I cannot recall exactly. It made reference to the fact the boss was soon to have a nervous breakdown. Having worked for it, he was deserving of it. While that little statement was intended to be amusing, I took it as factual and accurate, and began working on my ministry of reconciliation as time permitted. I projected the thoughts of my heart through the galaxies to the center of the universe to God, to that great planet where is located that heavenly temple, the abiding place of the King of Kings, and began to converse with Christ Jesus in the Holy of Holies. Precious Jesus, I need you, and I see this morning where you need me. I realize you wish to bless the life of this precious rich man, but demon spirits have succeeded in having him all to themselves. You were following the rules of the game of life played between the forces of good and evil for the control of the minds of people. And in this particular case, it places you where you are unable to shower this man's life with the peace of your love. I thank you, Lord, that you have called me to be a bearer of your peace to fellow mortals living in this trouble-filled world through the agency of prayer. By the merits of your precious blood shed on Calvary for the remission of sin, please forgive the iniquities and sins of this man sitting in my presence, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, rebuke the demon spirits that are torturing his mind, and bless him with the sweet peace of your love. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings to us. It wasn't more than five seconds that the man's conversation took on a new sense of direction. Instead of talking almost continually and shouting out unpleasantness, the tone of his voice abated to a sensible range, and he began to talk with what appeared to be intelligent reasoning, giving a chance to the party on the other end of the line to bring forth an explanation of his accomplishments, as I was soon to find out. The conversation closed on what appeared to be a tensionless note, and he hung up the phone. I'm Dennis, he said, as he stood up behind his desk, extending his hand toward me in a friendly way. Roger Morneau here, I said, as I shook his hand with firmness. Nice meeting you, Roger. It's too bad you had to happen to come on a day when everything is running rough. And really, I was amazed to see the change that had taken place in his personality. His stern-looking countenance that first appeared as some of those seen on monuments in city parks had been replaced by one expressing a truly relaxed state of mind. And a smile took form as he continued. I shouldn't be telling you this, but I think it will do me some good if I talk about it. From the moment I got up this morning, things began to upset me. First, I had disturbing words with my wife over the breakfast table. I can't figure out why she got up that early today. She never gets up until after I'm gone to work. Arriving at the place of business, aggravations piled up. And to top it all off, I got looking over the books that have to do with my other businesses, and seeing the poor results we attained for the last quarter, I became angry and blew my top in talking to one of my managers, as you just witnessed. He was lucky to be able to give me sound reasons, showing that actions beyond his control had taken place producing those poor results, or I would have fired him regardless of the fact that he has a sick wife and five kids. Taking a deep breath as he relaxed, he sat back in his reclining chair saying, right now I feel great. A short while ago, I felt as if I was carrying the world on my back. From now on, I refuse to let anything upset me. He even chuckled a bit over what he had said and then proceeded lighting another cigarette. We went on conversing, my bringing forth a couple of statements that were thought provoking and caused him to ask questions that gave me the opportunity to proceed into the spiritual, pointing him to the one that can change, wonderfully change, the most hopeless, discouraging outlook. His declining the opportunity from then on to converse on the spiritual led to our covering his advertising program as it related to the various phases of his business, and then I left for another call. Getting into my car, I drove away and lifted my heart up to God in thanksgiving for my having been instrumental in his blessing the life of that poor rich man, poor in heavenly love, joy, and peace, benefiting him with the sweet peace of God's love, something he had probably never experienced. Humanly speaking, he had everything money could buy that should make a person happy. But demon spirits made sure he couldn't enjoy the fruits of his labor. When I left him, he was joyful and hopeful. The Lord Jesus had gotten the demon spirits off his back, the expression a little crude but true. And again, the storm of life had abated and much needed calm had taken place by his power. The same one who commanded the turbulent sea of Galilee, peace be still. This experience is just one of the many that I've had because of the many people I find myself coming in contact with in my work. 
For some time I have been referring to such incidents as that of casting off devils. We read a great deal in the Bible about the Lord and his disciples having cast out devils. But in these modern times, while demon possession is still experienced by certain individuals, it is taking place on a limited scale. Modern scientific demons are using a new approach in carrying on their work of oppression and control on humans. They work from the outside in, perplexing, distressing their minds, and wrecking their lives. In this way, their presence and actions aren't recognized for what they truly are. I said earlier that Christians are passing through the land of the enemy. You and I have cap capacities or rights that no one else can exercise, not even the angels of heaven. That capacity, that right, consists of the ability to secure divine help from the throne of grace that can deliver fellow humans from the power and control of demon spirits. The Apostle Paul declares that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. He counsels on the importance of the Christian putting on the whole armor of God and then adds, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for the saints. And again, Timothy makes an appeal for those in, to prayer for those outside the family of God. I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. While Satan, the fallen angel, became the rightful owner of this planet and its contents, as he once declared to the Lord Jesus in the Gospel of Luke, and he continues to rule it until the second coming of Christ, his satanic influence and control over the lives of poor mortals can be broken by our prayers to Jesus Christ. On the other hand, as our Lord does free individuals from that capacity, cap satanic captivity, we must be mindful of the fact that our great Redeemer will not press them into service to himself. Jesus does not and will not force people to serve him. He respects his Father's great gift to, to those created in his image, the freedom of choice. The Bible makes it clear that God desires all his creatures to serve from love. Love that springs from an intelligent appreciation of his righteous character. The Lord takes no pleasure in a forced allegiance. To all people, he gives freedom of choice that they may render him voluntary service. I'd like to suggest that through our prayers to the Lord, we place the people we are praying for in a position or situation where they can make intelligent decisions regarding their well-being in this present life and for eternity. A few years back, I was in Union Springs, New York, enjoying the opening of the annual New York Conference camp meeting. It was a beautiful Sabbath day, one that began by my being brought out of dreamland by the sweet notes of an old-fashioned hymn softly played over the public address system, enriched by the sounds of a deep-toned organ. Stepping out of our cabin, I was met by a series of good wishes for the day as the usual good morning salutation came from all sides on the part of brothers and sisters in Christ, who were quickly moving on to prepare for the wonderful moments of inspiration that day. The morning Sabbath services proved to be what I had hoped they would, a savor of life unto life. These were the type of services that helped one raise his sights. The 11 o'clock service ended and we made our way out of the pavilion, enjoying the experience of shaking hands with longtime friends, many of whom we hadn't seen since the previous year. And we had the added pleasure of having our new meal with friends that my wife invited to join us in consuming some of the expertly prepared food she is so accustomed to making. Mm -hmm. So it was what could be referred to as the perfect day until I met a gentleman from Western New York later that afternoon. He gave me a sad bit of information in his answering my question as pertaining to the Christian experience of a certain young man whom I had held in high esteem in years past. Jack, he said, is no longer the sharp young Christian man you have known him to be. As a college-educated individual doing well and building himself a good future in this present world, he's lost the love he had for the Lord. As he became more and more involved in his daily occupation, his interests changed. The influence of some ungodly individuals he associated with in his work rubbed off, to the point that he changed his lifestyle outside the work circle. His leisure time became occupied with activities that not only separated him from God, but also from his wife. Whether he left her or she left him, I don't exactly know, but they are no longer together. 
He has become what is often called a modern swinger, and he's living it up to the highest degree possible. That was really sad, and I was searching my mind for words to express my disappointment when the man continued. An additional bit of information may interest you. A fellow who was in school with Jack a few years back reported that Jack stated to him that he has $1,000 worth of marijuana and other good stuff in his home. He finds his relaxation in grass and enjoys rock music. $5,000 sunk in a hi-fi stereo gives him the impression of being in the front row of a rock concert, so he's doped up and happy. <laughs> I could hardly believe my ears over the news I received. And my friend went on saying, don't feel too bad about him. He knew better than to get himself involved in a life of sin. He was brought up by godly parents, wonderful commandment-keeping people. Jack wanted that kind of life or he would have done something about getting away from it in the beginning. I think he's a hopeless case and I've given up praying for him. I spend my time praying for more worthy individuals. Then to reinforce his decision, he said, in talking to his mother not long ago, I got the impression that she slacked her praying over him. She feels if Jack has chosen that kind of life, there's nothing she can do about it. Hearing him give up on the fellow and expressing it as openly as he did, I felt sorrow and hurt for the young man and was prompted in saying, in other words, you feel that Jack is going to hell in high gear. Exactly. You couldn't have said it in more appropriate words. So we parted a few minutes later, and instead of going to a meeting that was about to begin, I went back to our cabin to reflect on that disturbing account. Being alone, I knelt and raised my heart to my great high priest, bringing before him the sad state of affairs regarding that precious young man, and I asked the Lord to bless my mind with the power of his love, leading me to engage in a prayer ministry of daily intercession, intercession for Jack that would put him in a position to make intelligent decisions for his life. My prayer ended, and, as, and I lay on my bed reflecting on the matter. In my mind, I could hear the man's words, I think he is a hopeless case. I've given up praying for him. What powerful negative words, I thought. I would have felt like giving up praying for the fellow too, were it not for the fact that I knew by experience that Christ is a mighty redeemer and he specializes in hopeless cases. I had been one of those unpromising individuals and how greatly the Spirit of God had wrought in my life to bless and deliver from the hand of the destroyer. A few minutes passed and I decided what course of action I should take. Yes, that's it. Experimental religion was needed here. A new prayer approach to solving a bad sin problem. While Jesus would not force Jack to serve him because people ask him to save the man, yet he could, by the mighty power of his Holy Spirit, in answer to specific daily prayers, free the man from the constant suggestions of demon spirits to wrongdoing and surround him with an atmosphere of heavenly grace that would be conducive to him making right decisions. I realized I must avoid falling into the inclination of praying in generalities, something that usually takes place when people have been praying for someone for a long time. I figured that it could take months, even years, before Jack could reach a decision, that the pleasures of the life of sin weren't worth the high cost. I would have to be fervent and diligent. Demon spirits would not give up trying to keep him under their control. So from that day on, I rose a bit earlier to seek divine help for the young man and I continued to pray every day. I prayed that he would bless, the, the, bless Jack's mind so that when he's found his joy and relaxation in smoking and enjoying rock music, which has a satanic function, he may escape that satanic captivity, heal his mind from the deterioration by, caused by the power of sin and the partaking of mind-altering substances and elevate it to a level of capacity that he can appreciate the sacred the beautiful and the divine. Whenever Jack finds himself assailed by demon spirits, I would appreciate very much if you would cause me to think of him, sense the urgency of the moment so that I can pray for him. And also, Lord, bless the life of his dear wife according to her needs and save them both. And I thank you for blessing in the lives of people I pray for and causing me to see my prayers answered before my eyes. Days turn to weeks, weeks into months, and months into years. Intercessory prayer through the merits of the blood of, of the Lord of glory has the capacity to work miracles and overrule the effect of the forces of evil. So it was that two years from the time I had begun to pray for Jack and his wife, to my great amazement, as I sat in the great pavilion on the first Sabbath of the camp meeting, I saw that precious couple walking hand in hand, making their way in the direction of the pavilion to attend the morning service. 
My heart leaped within me in a burst of joy as I saw them and became aware that I was seeing my prayers answered before my eyes. On that memorable day, I had the added joy of talking with the couple concerning the goodness of the Lord. But it was some time later I had the thrilling experience of hearing from Jack how the Spirit of God had operated in his life and worked on his behalf. It was about two years ago, he said, when I began to experience a change in the way I reasoned about my friends, my leisure time, my musical preferences, and other factors. Up to then, for about four years, I had turned away from spiritual matters and given myself up to enjoying what is known by the world as the good life. I was enjoying the pleasures of sin, and there was a superabundance of pleasures thrilling my life continually. From the moment I woke each morning to the time I retired, I was involved in some form of self-gratification or living in the anticipation of partaking in it. First thing I did after waking was to turn on my hi-fi stereo set to play some of my favorite rock music as I proceeded to get ready for work. I felt it was groovy and the beat of it satisfied an inner craving. Every weekend was taken up with a wild party somewhere, roaring with women, liquor, and whatever else could liven it up. By then my wife and I had broken up and I was completely free to live where I felt I could get the most enjoyment of it. But about two years ago, things began to change. First, my rock music went flat on me. One evening, I arrived home, I turned on my hi-fi, placed one of my favorite records on the turntable, that tells you how old this story is, and then sat comfortably on a, with a glass of my favorite beverage in one hand and a newspaper in the other. I took a couple of sips, read, read for a couple of minutes, and then sensed something wasn't right. The music wasn't quite the same. Something was missing. And it wasn't enjoyable as it had been, so I checked the controls on the set. All was right, but my rock music had lost some of its appeal, but I couldn't zero in on that missing element. The doorbell rang and there was Albert, a close buddy of mine and a self-pronounced rock music expert. I opened up. Albert, you came at the right time. Something has gone wrong with my hi-fi set. It's not reproducing the music on this record. It's missing something. I've played this record a thousand times. I know there's something lacking. So we played the record again, and halfway through it, Albert began to laugh. Jack, the time has come for you to sell that stereo set. It's not performing to your liking anymore, but to me it's super. I've come to borrow some one of your tools and I'll bring it back in a couple of days. So he left and I continued listening to additional rock records, realizing that they lacked that captivating es essence they used to possess. The situation grew worse, or better, depending on how you look at it, and it came to the point that in a few months I actually hated that music. In fact, one evening I dusted off the jackets of some of my old symphony records and from then on played classical music to relax. So he continued to fill me in on details that turned out to be direct answers to what I had asked the Lord to benefit his life with. Talk about God taking care of the undeserving, Jack said. It's just plain amazing. In one instance, I lost control of my car when I passed through a pothole going downhill. I thought it was the end of me. The car began zigzagging from one side of the road to the other and then headed directly for the abutment of a bridge railing and veered off just in time to miss it by mere inches. An angel of the Lord must have taken charge of things for I had no control of the car on the wet pavement. So after hearing this, I stated that many, the prayers of many of God's people must have been working in his behalf and Jack agreed. He volunteered some additional information that led me to understand why a few times I woke up at night deeply impressed with a sense of urgency in praying for him, and it happened all of those instances were on Saturday nights, which was his partying time. At that time, I had given up on God and eternal life and decided having only this present life before me, I would enjoy it to the fullest, even if it meant killing myself in doing so. Every weekend, I attended a wild party where anything went. One time, I was pretty well loaded with booze, the whole gang of us almost raising the roof with our music and singing, at about 1 a.m., something really strange happened to me. A couple of the girls were passing around a mixture of a drink they claimed would thrill a person from the toenails to the roots of his hair. When I was about to take the potion, a voice came from behind me saying, Jack, don't you take that. If you do, it will kill you. I felt a touch on my right shoulder as the words were spoken and quickly turned around. No one was there. That touch I felt on my shoulder sent a shiver through my whole body. And to my amazement, I instantly became as sober as if I hadn't taken a single drink. Feeling greatly out of place, I excused myself and left. And as I drove down the road, I realized I didn't even smell liquor on my breath. So that experience got me thinking. And that, 
God hadn't given up. While I had given up on God, he hadn't given up to me, on me, and that was the beginning of doing a lot of thinking about this present life. I had a lot of backtracking to do in order to get on the right road again. There was the matter of making things right with my wife and winning her back to me. It would take time to heal the old wounds and reestablish her confidence in me. But the Lord blessed, and I wouldn't be working alone. And this day, I thank God for his love for us, for bringing together, being together is a reality. And I can let that go right here, because I think there's a few more pages on here. No. It's getting kind of a long <clears throat> one. Yeah. Finishing up with a bang there. So anyway, what's uh, what's the <clears throat> emphasis so far in this first part of this chapter here? Seems like prayer ministry. Yeah, it's an intercessory prayer ministry. Um, <clears throat> find that quite appropriate considering the, the seal that we're going to be on opening, uh, opening to on opening? On opening. On opening. Resealing. Resealing. <laughs> opening. Uh, this time. We're covering the uncovering. <coughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> well, anyway, thanks for that. Um, we'll pick that up next week and uh, finish that up. Um, how how important would a prayer ministry be if <clears throat> I mean, what would be the result if every Christian had something like that going? Well, let's let's ask the question. Do you think most Christians have a prayer ministry? Nope. Yeah, not to the extent where you're interceding in behalf of somebody else. So uh, there are a lot of Christians say they'll pray for you, but they really don't. You know, it's just what you say. It's kind of cliche, right? Cliche. <clears throat> um, and he's talking about praying for specific things, not not just generalities, but specific things. Um, one day, one day we'll have to do a, a, a study on on intercessory prayer. Um, we don't have time to do it today, but um, you know, it kind of begs the question: Why is it even necessary? Doesn't God know all things about all people? I mean, doesn't He have the? Uh, I mean, he's, he's demonstrated that He has an infinite love for everybody by what He's done. In, in providing the plan of salvation. So why do we need to ask him to do something for, something. for somebody else? Because he's giving you free all their shoes? No. I mean, it's, it, it's, I mean, that's just a kind of a rhetorical question. <laughs> um, and we'll have to study that out a little bit. Uh, obviously, intercessory prayer works. Uh, you know, we just heard several examples there. And probably in your own experience, uh, certainly in our experience here um, we have seen it work as well so uh, it's just interesting that you know in trying to discover the the answer to that question um, I think it would help us <clears throat> and that we would we would that would be something that we would definitely want to do as Christians to uh, pray for others mm -hmm. so it definitely works all right, so we're going to continue on. We'll get back to that uh, rest of the story next week. We're going to go ahead and, and uh, continue our study here. Revelation chapter 6 is where we are. I hope you had a chance to read through a couple of these verses here. Um, and again, what I want to remind people of, we'll take the time next week, since we have some folks that are missing today because of the weather, um, we'll take the time next week to kind of review, go through and review this a little bit uh, more thoroughly. But <clears throat> keeping in context, if we want to stay within the context of the book of Revelation, what should the seals, we're, we're, we're you know, six chapters into the book, but what are the seals? The un unsealing of the <clears throat> of the book should really be about <clears throat> making a making known of who, a revealing of who. Christ. <clears throat> in my opinion, I think if you stay with the context of the book, since it is a book revealing the Messiah, 
the opening of the seals should specifically relate to his activity and specifically uh, because it states that he is the only one that can open them or loosen them. He's the only one that's qualified. He's the only one that has uh, <clears throat> uh, accomplished the things necessary to have the right to unloosen the seals. You see. And so I think that the unloosening of the seals is simply his activities in accomplishing the plan of salvation for humanity. Does that make sense, staying within the context of what the book is about? <clears throat> I think that it does. So you can see from our chart here, um, you know, the first four that we've looked at specifically, I believe the ultimate the ultimate fulfillment relating to Christ himself, the Messiah himself, would be his victory in the wilderness of temptation, uh, his 1260 days of ministry or service to humanity, being an example, um, and certainly he prayed for other people, so there, there, there again is an example for us. And then, of course, his Gethsemane experience and his, his uh, trek to Calvary, which was the script, the, the script that the Father had written, that he and the Father had worked out. <laughs> and, and this would, of course, <laughs> highlight the main considerations there of him being a conqueror and him confronting the world, uh, taking peace from the world, as, it, as it's stated. And, and, of course, he would need wisdom to really make this spiritual decision in Gethsemane. That was the darkest moment of his, uh, his experience on earth, and therefore he's riding that black horse. And so, you know, everything kind of fits together with, with the uh, things that he would accomplish. And then we, we come down to the opening of the fifth seal. We'll go ahead and read that, read these couple of verses, and then we'll kind of unpack it a little bit. Uh, this is verse, uh, verse 9, chapter 6. When he, Messiah, opened the fifth seal, I saw unto the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. Okay. <clears throat> so that's what's taking place under the fifth seal. Now let me ask you a question um, kind of before we get started here. Um, <clears throat> why not another horse? Why, why don't you think you know, we've already had four horses. Why don't? Why doesn't it continue with? And you know, we have a purple horse. You know, why? Why not another horse to open the the sixth seal? And you know, why not? Why not seven horses instead of four horses of the apocalypse? You know, why don't? Why isn't it seven horses that are introduced here? What do you? you th have you? <clears throat> you think there's any reason why it stops at that point with the? The horses and the rider, etc. I mean, obviously, there's a change in perspective there, right? Mm -hmm. is, is that what you would, you would think? Well, that and now the four beasts start talking to John. He's okay. I think that's that again is also significant. There are only four beasts, and each of the beasts, the lion, the ox, the man, and the eagle, we'll call them that. Uh, they're the ones that are telling John, hey, come and see this. Mm -hmm. And so you don't have a fifth creature. You don't have a sixth creature or a seventh creature. You only have four. And so I think that, I think it's, I think it's telling us that there's a major shift in perspective here. A major shift in, <clears throat> in, uh, <clears throat> in consideration that's taking place. And I think that's the reason why it, it moves to uh, to just when he opened and he saw something else instead of a horse and a rider. Okay. 
that makes sense? <clears throat> now, um, I'm going to just share with you some of the things that I've written about this particular seal out of um, the little booklet that I compiled that we're working on. Uh, we'll eventually have that published. And people will be able to go ahead and get the book, which is a little more comprehensive than what we're doing here in the hour that we have. It says here, uh, Revelation 6-9 brings us to the opening of the fifth seal. John sees under an altar. Um, what about this altar? He sees, uh, it says here, souls, the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. So, who would those people be? The saints. Okay, they would be uh, people that have been martyred for their faith, right? It says here they were slain, souls who had been slain, okay? Now, what about under the altar here? Uh, what altar is John being directed to, do you think? Well, what comes to my mind is the altar of sacrifice. Okay, why would you Have think that? that? Because there are, you know, obviously attention is being drawn here to um, the sanctuary. You're mentioning, you know, an altar. In, in the sanctuary, how many altars were in the sanctuary? Just one? Or technically two. Like the mercy seat and the altar of... Basically, there was an altar in, in, each, altar in, each, sec in each section. Yeah. There was an altar in the courtyard, mm -hmm. right? That was the sacrificial altar. <clears throat> um, that's the one that is most uh, specifically mentioned. The word altar in, uh, in the concordance, I think, is mentioned like tw uh, you know, two dozen times, 23, 24 times. Unless it says specifically altar of incense, or the incense altar, or, or, or something to that effect, it's it's actually referring to the altar sacrifice. So you were you were right, Elijah. Um, but you had an altar really in each section. You had the altar sacrifice in the outer court. What altar was in the holy place? I just mentioned it. Altar the altar of incense. of incense, right? And that that stood uh, right in front of the curtain that separated the holy place from the most holy and that incense would, would actually go up it was incense that was would burn continually and it would it would go up and that fragrance would go into the most holy place okay and of course in the most holy place you, you had really just that the ark of the covenant was in there and that was also technically an altar all right and what would that receive or what did that receive symbolically every year on the Day of Atonement. That received the sprinkling of blood, right? And the high priest went in to minister before that particular altar as well once a year, right? And that would also be the place where Christ's blood would be applied um, in the future. Uh, the reality, the reality of what the high priest was due would occur at Calvary when Messiah as the high priest would sprinkle his own blood onto the mercy seat. So you see how that all fits together. All right, so that's the, alt the altar that we're talking about here is the altar of sacrifice. And why would, why would that particular altar be used? We're talking about people that have kind of made themselves the offerings to God? Exactly. Okay. Okay. They, have, they have become a sacrifice unto God themselves with their own lives. Right, with the very lies themselves. Uh, they shed their blood, they spilled their blood for the cause of Christ. Right? <clears throat> so that's an important consideration. Um, the word for soul there is psyche in the Greek, and it denotes breath, and is defined almost a hundred times as a life or a soul once lived. A life or a soul once lived. That's when you go back to the book of Genesis. Um, Genesis chapter 2 <clears throat> where it talks about God formed man of the dust of the ground verse 7 and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul so it took the 
the forming of the dust, right, the body, forming the body, but it's a lifeless body unless God breathes into that body the breath of life, right? And so what's the, <clears throat> what's, what does the soul consist of? When we say that, you know, bless that soul or these souls were under the altar, what does that soul consist of? Body, it consists of a body and the breath. The combination of the two things there is what equals a soul or a living being. Okay? Once a soul, once a, a living being has sacrificed themselves as a martyr, right, they're a dead soul, all right, or a non-living person, a, a soul that once lived, or a being that once lived. Um, <clears throat> yeah, almost a hundred times. It's defined as a life or a soul once lived with thoughts, feelings, desires, etc. It's a representation of those who were martyred for their faith and, and commitment to the cause of Christ. Their cry is a metaphorical one, right? It talks here how uh, uh, they say, verse 10 there, and they cry with a loud voice. So how is a martyred, non-living person crying out? It's a metaphor. I'd say, well, the standard Christian would would uh, would argue that it was a literal crying out to some extent, I imagine. Yeah, there's debate. Um, State of the dead kind of thing. Right. So, uh, there's there's debate in regards to uh, you know if souls have conscience, uh, thoughts, and things of that nature. Some people may even use a scripture like this to try to support that view. But, but really, when you take into consideration the rest of what Scripture indicates, uh, this is a metaphorical one, not literal. And it's used to present a simple question to God. And what's the question that they're really asking? Why are you delaying your coming? Why are you delaying your coming? Jerry, is that wood stove getting too hot over there? It's warm. What kind of... Um... Seems okay over here. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. At the moment. Good. Okay, so they're asking basically, how long is the injustice and persecution in our, in our world going to last? Now, it's not unusual, when you go through Scripture, it's not unusual for people to ask God certain questions. Uh, especially if they're going through, uh, you know, difficulties and circumstances where they think that, you know, God, where are you? That, that, that's a question people might ask. You know, things are happening, they don't understand why. How about, you know, when we think, when you read the book of Job, isn't that a question that Job would have asked? You know, Lord, Lord, where are you? What's going on? Why are you allowing these things to happen? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm trusting you, and yet this is happening, and this is happening. So, it's not unusual or uncommon to ask questions. If you go to uh, Psalm 79.5, for example, here's a question. Uh, Lord, wilt thou be angry forever? Shall thy jealousy burn like fire? That's a question. Uh, Psalm eighty-nine forty-six. How long, Lord, wilt thou hide thyself forever? Shall thy wrath burn like fire? And then the essence, really, of the question that's being asked under the fifth seal is summed up in Psalm ninety-four and verse three. Lord, how long shall the wicked? How long shall the wicked triumph? And, you know, David, of course, who was writing uh, these songs, uh, basically he, he would ask this kind of thing, you know, as, as difficulties seemed to overwhelm him, he would ask questions like this, Lord, how long is this going to last? You know, where are you? Uh, how long is, is evil going to triumph over good? That kind of thing. So it's not unusual, and yet we have the same kind of question being asked right here. How long, Lord? holy and true, right? until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. So, what are they basically asking there? You know, how long before the uh, evil is dealt with? You know, how long before judgment is going to occur? Uh, the word there, the key, key word there is judge. And that helps us to determine what role Christ is playing as the fifth seal is being opened. Okay? The word judge is the Greek word krino, K-R-I-N-O. 
And, and it simply means, and let me give you all these definitions here so you really get the picture. The word crino means to separate, to put asunder, to pick out, to select, to choose, to approve, esteem, to prefer, to be of opinion, to deem, to think, to determine, to resolve, to decree, to judge. So you get the picture? Okay. Uh, you know, there's this, this judgment that's taking place, this choosing, this determining, uh, this investigation that's going on. Right? Um, and so when we think about the next phase in the work of the Messiah, you know, he's, he's come as the second Adam, pure and holy, but he has to be victorious as a man. He, 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 he takes the peace from the earth as light breaks through into darkness and dispels it. He's confronting the world with sin uh, and, and, and evil and unrighteousness. And so his ministry is directed to do that, even though he's providing an example of holiness at the same time. He, he eventually goes to Gethsemane, where the spiritual victory over sin and death actually is chosen. He chooses in Gethsemane to go ahead with the play, even though he, he can't see through the portals of the tomb, he can't see how this is going to play out and how it's going to work, how, how it's going to be successful. He trusts the, the, the plan that the Father has put together. That's why he asks him three times, you know, not my will, but thy will. For if there's another way, take this cup from me. He's, he's questioning, he's wondering. And yet he chooses to go ahead. He, 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 the balance, the balance is he's holding in his hand. And he chooses to go ahead with the plan. And of course that plan leads him to take a ride on the pale horse. The, the, the green horse, really. Uh, Chlor Chloris. Chloris, the green horse, which seems to be the antithesis of death. Because green is the color of life, you see. And so that's a depiction of him going to Calvary and laying down his life. And he talks about that in John 12, how... A seed put in the ground, you know, a, a seed that's dormant and that seems to be dead, all of a sudden is germinated and brings forth life. It's it's a it's a it's a uh, illustration of what would happen to Calvary. He gives his life so that millions, multitudes may have life eternal. So you see how that plays out. Well, now his next, what is his next role? What is the next role that he plays? After his ascension, right? He's mediator, right? He plays the role of mediator in heaven. When he when he leaves earth, he goes to the holy place in the sanctuary above, and he takes on a mediatorial role. He, he's our advocate. He's our ad advocate out there. He's he's judging. He's determining. Uh, he's deciding. He's, he's uh, watching what's happening down here. And, uh, of course, when we pray, where do our prayers go? They go up to the sanctuary in heaven for consideration. Okay? Now, the key word in Revelation 5.12, we've, we've, been, we've been looking at the clues there in Revelation 5, uh, verse 12 there. And you can see how those words correspond to the role that the Messiah would play. He would need power to be victorious in the wilderness. The riches that he would receive as a result of his service and example would be that those that chose him, those that became Christian, they would be the riches he received. He would need an incredible amount of wisdom to make the right choice in Gethsemane. He would need an incredible amount of strength to go through what would, what would be unleashed on him at Calvary. So you see how those, those key words implement. And, and of course the key word uh, continuing for the fifth seal would be honor. Now that, and that's an interesting word, right? Honor. Let me uh, give you the definition. In fact, if I asked you to give me a definition of honor, what would be your definition? What does it mean to be honorable? What, what would be the definition of honor? To be respectful, respectable. To be respected. Okay. You think when Christ went to the sanctuary, he was resurrected because of 
as the high priest, he makes the application of the blood, so the price, the sacrificial price is paid in full. And so it allows legally, now it allows legally the father to resurrect his son because the price for sin has been paid. The, the, the law has been covered. Right? And, he's, and he's, of course he's given his life, he's laid down his life, so he's played the substitutionary role. He's ransomed and he's become the atonement. And so the Father is able to resurrect him. When he gets to heaven, do you think they thought, well, I wonder who that guy is. Wow, well, look at that, look at the thing he's doing, you know. Wow, well, you know, he must have been, he must have been promoted or something. No, do you think there would be tremendous respect, tremendous honor paid to, to the Son of God and what He's now done. That he, he's there as a glorified human being. Right? So He would receive tremendous respect and tremendous honor. Okay? But let me give you a, 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 a dictionary definition here. Uh, it says, The backdrop is one of the sanctuary. Christ's pre-advent work of judgment is there. The key word from Revelation 5.12 that corresponds to this work is, uh, of the Messiah is the word honor. Now here's a, here's a dictionary definition. A valuing by which the price is fixed. It's a validation. When you honor someone, it's a validation of something significant that they've done or are doing. Okay? So it's a valuing by which the price is fixed. I mean, that so clearly presents the work the next phase that Messiah would be undertaking in the heavenly sanctuary above and then eventually into the most holy place with the Father, right? He said, it is truly a work of the fixing of all human destiny that is underway in the sanctuary above. When this work of investigation and determination is over, probationary time will close and Christ will prepare to return to rescue the redeemed. So, honor is the perfect word here. It's a fixing of respect and validation on what Christ is doing. And the work that he's doing is actually fixing the, the, the destiny, eternally fixing the destiny of every human being. That, that work of review, investigation, that's been underway since he went to the sanctuary after the resurrection. And then of course in 1844 as we as we looked at under the uh, churches, the, under the Church of Philadelphia, that would have been the timing in 1844 where he moves from the holy place into the most holy. And what's significant about that? What's the significance about going from the holy to the most holy? It's to accomplish the the final phase. It's the final phase of completing that work of investigation, right? Mm -hmm. now, now, now you're investigating not only the, those that have been martyred, those that have gone before, but now you're investigating who? You're investigating the living, right? You're investigating the living. Because why, why is it important to have an investigation on those that are not only dead, but also alive? Because you're going to have both groups both of those groups available, uh, uh, available right. when Christ comes, right? Christ comes, they're going to be the living and the dead. You're going to have both groups there, righteous and unrighteous. So you have four categories. But why is it important to investigate the living? Why is it important that their lives have been reviewed and a determination has been made and their destiny is also fixed? Why is that important? Because, I mean, it allows Christ to then close human probationary time. That's why Revelation 22 at the end of the book here, it well, says, he that is righteous, he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. That he that is filthy, let him be filthy still. You see, that it, it's, it's actually a, a definitive de declaration for all four of those categories, living and dead, righteous and unrighteous. Right? Something that I thought was interesting too. Just from, at least from like uh, the perspective of like what few of Japan believed in, there's honor and death, which is kind of the same thing. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so eventually, I mean, this is really what's taking place. 
under the fifth seal. Okay. This is what's happening under the fifth. What What's the next seal? Anybody look ahead and find out what the next seal is? We're going to kind of be going to that. I think we'll have time to get to that one, too. The second coming? Maybe. We might not, but maybe. The second coming. Okay, almost all Christianity agrees that the second coming is the opening, occurs at the opening of the sixth seal. Well, this investigation has to take place prior to that because what happens when Jesus comes? Every case is decided. Why does, that have, why does it have to be? Why does every case have to be decided before he comes? Because probation is Because closed. my reward is with me to give to every man according as his work shall be. So when Christ comes a second time, every case has been decided because the reward is going to be uh, received at that moment. Okay? That's Revelation 22, uh, 12. Back there is what we were just quoting there. <clears throat> Now, verse 11 is very interesting, too. Verse 11 is very interesting. All right, so the main focus, uh, of course, the mission here is Christ as mediator. The main focus is, in uh, the opening of the seal, is when, is really, it's almost a timing question, isn't it? It's when is that going to you know, when, when is it going to be? When is this judgment going to be over? So really, this is kind of a timing question that becomes a main focus here, right? Um, it's kind of a time issue here. They're asking, and then what's the response? What's the response that John receives? Right? Ver it's, it's the next verse. It's verse 11. Is the... the, the Verse three, he says, Then a white robe was given to each of them. Each of who? Who's the white robe given to? The dead saints. All the, all the saints. The saints that have martyred yeah, martyr. and mourned. All those really who have died uh, in the faith. Um, a white robe was given to them. And it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and of their brethren who were killed as they were, were completed. So it talks about their fellow servants and their brethren. So that, that really... Mine says that should be killed. That should be killed. Meaning he's still alive. Right. Right. It should be killed. Okay, so what does this indicate? What does this scripture indicate? Because, the, again, they're metaphorically saying, how long is this going to drag on, Lord? How long is this judgment going to go on? this determination going to go on so that we can receive our, finally receive our reward. Okay? How long uh, before your name is vindicated in all the earth? That's, that's another part of that question there. So when it says white, a white robe is given to them, what does that mean? So Christ's righteousness. Okay, there, there are four references in Scripture that talk about white robes. All right? What's interesting about this is there, that there's a, a, um, a difference in how people receive the white robe. How, how did these people, how did these martyrs, these people that have passed, how did they receive their white robe? It was given to them. It was given to them. Okay? Uh, because of their faith in the plan of, of, of their faith in the Messiah and the plan of salvation, they are given a white robe. Okay? Well, that's pretty nice. Didn't, didn't have to... I mean, you can't work for it. Right? You can't even work for your white robe. Right? So it has to be given to you. Okay? You follow? Mm -hmm. And of course, but it's specifically being pointed out here. But now there's a difference between that verse and there's... Uh, if you look at, uh, over in chapter 7 there, in chapter 7... Uh, which we'll get to in a few weeks here. Um, it talks about the 144,000. That's where they come in the uh, first time they're introduced. Mm -hmm. And it says in verse 13 that um, because the, one of the elders is asking, one of the 24 elders is asking, you know, who are these that are arrayed in white robes and where did they come from? And it says there, these are the ones who came out of great tribulation. 
Well, is it the martyrs that came out of Great Tribulation? I mean, to be martyred would certainly be a personal Great Tribulation, right? To give up your life for the cause of Christ. But is that the Great Tribulation they're talking about here? This is a corporate Great Tribulation. This is a worldwide Great Tribulation that they're talking about in Chapter 7. Has that occurred yet? That's still yet future. Okay? That Great Tribulation is still yet future. So, he's talking about these are the ones who came out of Great Tribulation. But notice what it says. They washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So we have a difference here. We've got one group that have been laid to rest, have died in the faith uh, in the Messiah. They're given a white robe. Okay? But here are living saints. Did they ever die? Did the 144,000 ever die? They never die. Okay, the 144,000 live through never tasting death, right? And so because they never taste death, they're not given a white robe. How do they get their robe? Is the white robe part of the seal of uh, God? Well, it's the righteousness or right doing of okay. the Messiah that is accounted to you because of your faith in what the Messiah, what the Father and the Son have done. Because you believe in the covenant that the Father and the Son have, have put together this plan of salvation. You believe in that plan. You believe in what Messiah has done, taking your place, covering covering the law, you know, yeah. with His omnipresence. So you believe in, in the plan and all of that. But it says you wash your robe in the blood of the Lamb. So what, what's the difference between the two? One group, obviously one group, the, the, one, obviously, the obvious difference is one group is dead and the other group is living. Okay? One group just is given a white robe. The other group washes their robe in the blood of the Lamb. What, what is that, what's the difference between the two? What, what, what does that mean? What do you think it means to wash the robes? It's like actively, actively putting your um, faith in. Well, here's the thing. While living, while living, they receive the white robe of righteousness. Right? They don't. They don't get it just after they after they're dead. In other words, a after. Once your probation personally closes, you're no longer making any choices. You're no longer making That's any decisions. Okay, so Christ can look at that person and He can say, "That person believed in me. That person accepted me as Savior. I can give that person a white robe." Because at the wedding, at the wedding banquet, the King comes in to. Re this is Matthew chapter 22. We looked at it yeah. months and months ago. The, the, the king comes in to the wedding banquet and he's looking to see if you have on the white robe. The wedding garment. The white robe, right? And if you don't have on the white robe, what happens? What are you doing here? Bind him. What are you doing here? You, you don't belong here. Out you go. Okay. okay. Alright, so in order to be at the wedding banquet, you have to have the white but and that's which is Christ the has given these people that they're the probationers, he's given them a white robe. But but those that are living through to the end, right, they receive a white robe while they're living, but it's because they're washing the robe in the blood of the Lamb. What does that phrase mean? What do you think that phrase means? Washing their robe in the blood of the Lamb. Actively. When you're washing something, that's an action, right? That's, you're, you're, you're getting rid of what? Dirt. The dirt, the filth, the stains, the things uh, you know that that that, that make it look uh, <clears throat> un unpleasant. Okay, and so when you're washing your robe in the blood of the Lamb, what do you think that means for this this group that are living through to the end? What does that mean? They're in the total light. You're accepting the merits of. His blood to purify. Well, the merit. Okay, yeah. you 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 are living 
you've grown to the place in your Christian experience where you're living a sanctified life. Who else lived a sanctified life while they were living? Christ. Only one. Only, only one ever lived a sanctified life while living. That was Jesus, right? right? And so these, this group of 144,000, they begin to reflect that same character. They begin to live their lives. So do they see our white robes at the point of when God's information is and light is versus total dark or total light versus total dark? Let me, let me back up here a second. I'll show you. 1 John 3, 2. This is the same author, right? The same John. In 1 John chapter 3, in verse 2, well, we'll read the first three verses here. In, in 1 John chapter 3, look at the first three verses there. It says, Beloved, what manner of love the Father has, has bestowed on us. And of course, that, that love that He bestowed on us was the giving of His Son, right? That we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know Him. Beloved, now are we the children of God. In other words, once you accept Christ and, are, and, and so forth, you receive His merit, the merit of His right doing. And so when God looks at you, He sees the right doing of His Son. He sees the righteousness of His Son. So He declares you to be justified. Now you are, a, I'm declaring you to be a child of God. Right? Now are we the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. In other words, we're a child of God, but we're going to grow <clears throat> in grace and re begin to reflect. At some point, we're going to begin to reflect the very character of Christ. That's what it says here. And has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know, not we believe, we know that when He is revealed... We shall be like Him. Well, when is He revealed? He is revealed when He comes in glory under the sixth seal. Right? When He comes in glory, that's when He's revealed. For we shall see Him as He is. How can we see Him as He is? How can we be like Him when He, when he comes a second time? How can we be reflecting His character? Because we've been washing our robes in the blood of the Lamb. We've been claiming victory. We've been walking in victory by faith. We've been walking under the power, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit by faith, you see. And, and this, this, is, this is what's happening. This is why, this, this, this shows the timing that an investigation was going on. God, God took care of the, those, that were, the, those that had fallen asleep in Him. But then He moves on to the living saints, Right? White robes are given to them, and it says they're going to rest a little while that, that until both the number of their fellow servants, well, that number of the fellow servants, right, that should be killed, is going to be everybody except the 144,000, right? There are only going to be 144,000 living saints that go all the way through to the end. Great tribulation. Okay. And there's a reason for that. People are, people are probably saying, you know, and think about people are probably thinking, well, how could that be? How could there only be 144,000 left? There's a reason for that happening. If you read the story of Gideon, okay, the story of Gideon, there's a reason why God allows the number of saints to be whittled down to what seems to be a relative few, 144,000 is a is a, a, a you know a pretty good sized group of people, right? There are many cities in our country here that don't have 144,000 people. In fact, Roanoke, which is the closest to us up the road there, about an hour, they probably have about 144,000 people. The whole city of Roanoke, right? But the whole city of Roanoke, even if you have 144,000 people up there or 150,000 people up there. That's relatively few compared to the 335 million or so that live in our country. That's relatively few compared to the 7.5 million billion. billion that live in the in the uh, on the planet. Okay, relative few. All right. So in comparison, the same the same thing that's happening at the end is the same thing that happened 
we already have an example of this very same thing happening, and for the very same reason, I might add, back in Judges chapter 6 to 8, the story of Gideon. When Gideon called his army to go out against the Midianites, anybody remember how many Midianites there were in the Jezreel Valley? How many Midianites were in the Jezreel Valley? Great army of Midianites. And for year, for seven years, seven years they have been ravaging and pillaging and, and, and causing problems. So Gideon is off at the, in the threshing floor where he is planting some, some wheat or barley or whatever it is that he's threshing. He, he's in a place of seclusion because they can't have just an open field because the Midianite army, like locusts, come in there and they, they pillage all of it, right? How many Midianites are there in that big army? Big, huge army. I want to say it was like 18,000, wasn't it? 135,000 okay. Midianites. Okay, that's a... I was between 120 and That's a huge army, right? That's like the city... That's a huge army. When Gideon makes his call... Because remember, God comes to Gideon and says, I want you, and you can read all this in Judges chapter 6 to 8, all the detail, but God comes to Gideon and he says, Gideon, mighty man of valor. And Gideon's thinking, mighty man of valor? Who's he talking to? You know, here I am hiding. Mm -hmm. I'm hiding, right? And he's calling me a mighty man of valor, right? Gideon, I want you. You're my guy. Okay, I've chosen you. I want you to come and raise up an army, send out the call to all the tribes. We're gonna we're gonna defeat these Midian. We're gonna get rid of these Midianites. Gideon sends out the call. General Gideon sends out the call. How many people show up? Uh, three hundred. Twenty thousand. Jeez, need to read back on that story. Yeah, guys. <laughs> it was a pretty big number, but still 30, not thirty-two thousand. Thirty-two thousand. Thirty-two thousand. Well, wait a minute. Thirty-two thousand is a good-sized army. That's several, you know, uh, companies. And, I mean, that's a lot of people, right? Thirty-two thousand. I think there's what ten thousand in a in a, uh, in a brigade or something. I can't remember what it is. But uh, legion. In a legion, brigade, whatever. Okay. So anyway, you've got. They may mean the same thing, but but anyway, you've got like at least you got thirty-two thousand people that respond to this call for war. But what does God say? God finally looks at the situation and he says, Gideon, Judges 7 and verse 2, if you look that up, Gideon, there are too many for you, there are too many of you for me to give you <laughs> victory over the Midian. And you know, Gideon is probably thinking, that math doesn't, what do you mean too many? You know, there's, we're out, or, outnumbered four and a half to one still. You know, how can there be too many? You know, but Judges 7 verse 2 is, is a decree that explains if God had given that good sized army the victory over this huge army, they would have said, Look what we have done. They would have said, That's exactly what 7 verse 2 says, Look what we have done. Oh, man, we are so wonderful. We just, you know, we took care of them, man. You know, they would have claimed the glory for themselves. So how's God going to work around that? How's God going to eliminate the possibility? He's going to shorten it to an impossible amount of people. He's going to take the number down to an impossible number. God already knows he's going to give them the victory. He could have taken one angel and killed them all, though. <laughs> he, he already knows they're going to give them but he, he has to he, he wants the human element involved here. And so he he all he has to do is drop the number down, 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 whittle it down to an impossible scenario. Right? And and as you know the story, right? He he tells them, he taps Gideon on the shoulder, and there's a, a, a military code. There's a decree that before any battle, Israel had to make a decree before any battle. This is in Deuteronomy, the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 20, the first nine, eight or nine verses. There's a military decree there that says, if you've just built a house and you haven't lived in it for a whole year, you're excused. If you've just gotten married and you're a newlywed, you are excused. Right? If you've just planted 
a vineyard or a garden, and you haven't harvested out of that garden yet, you are excused. Or, if you are afraid, if you are afraid, go home. Right? Well, Gideon hadn't made that announcement. He hadn't made that because he already knew he was still outnumbered. Right? I'm outnumbered four to one. I'm not going to say anything. I want everybody I can get. So, but God taps him on the shoulder and he says, Gideon, don't forget the decree. Don't forget the decree, Gideon. And so Gideon makes the decree, and what happens? Huge number of 22,000 people leave. Hello? Man, that is a lot of planning and gardening and, and then he starts the, the river. Right? And then he, yeah, and then, and then God comes with an, another, what seems to be an absurd, Gideon, your army is still too large. Take them down to the river, and I, God says, I will test them. And he takes them down to the river. Testing who's ready for war. And most of them, you know, if they have any armor on, they throw it off, they lay their stuff aside, they get down there like a dog, and they're lapping water up like a dog at the river. Only 300 walk through the river, bringing water up to their mouth, and Ellen White makes an interesting comment. She says, in anticipation, these are the words yeah, she ready uses, for battle right now. In anticipation of a immediate assault upon the enemy. In other words, these guys are ready to go. They think they're going to go right to battle. They're going to get a drink and they're going to go to battle, these guys. That's what they, they're thinking. 300 of them. God says, there's your group right there. There's your guys. You know? But then God, to, but then God says, all right, take them over to the armory and get the M4s and the uh, machine guns, the 50 cals. Make sure you got plenty of grenades, right? And here's some high-tech laser weaponry, right? That's not what he says, right? He takes these 300 guys and he says, give them a torch, give them a trumpet, right? <laughs> Here I am. <laughs> I'm over here. <laughs> it's like right? waiting to a flag. I mean, that is, that is the total. I mean, you talk about being disadvantaged in a covert operation. You're making noise and you're you're shining light. That's the, that's the total thing you don't want to do, right? They 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 split up on this mountainside and at the appropriate I mean you know the story the appropriate moment God says break the the the, the uh, jar over your torch let your light shine run down the hill blowing the trumpet right and crying you know sword of Gideon or I can't remember the exact word sword for the Lord and Gideon. sword for the Lord and Gideon okay sword for the Lord and Gideon there you go and in the Midianite camp I mean literally. Last. It just all break. I mean, all hell breaks loose in the camp. I mean, and they're fighting each other, killing each other, you know, because these 300 guys are all around the, the, the valley there. God is giving them the victory, but for 300 men with no weapons other than a, a torch and a trumpet, mm -hmm. running into battle, scream, you know, screaming and hollering. Impossible. That is an impossible scenario. Okay, the same exact thing. The same exact thing is happening at the end of time. It's because the weapons of our warfare. At the are not end, carnal. because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. To the right? destroying of the Midianites. <laughs> that the imagination, right, pulling down the imagination of every high thing that exalted itself against God. Okay. That, captivity that is describing the 144,000, right? In their mind, their minds have become sanctified, so their actions are sanctified, right? And they're still living. That's why that, that's how they're washing their, their robes in the blood of the Lamb. And that's what's, that's, that's of course, moving into the sixth seal, but that was all brought out because to show the difference between those who are given a white robe and those who are washing the robes in the blood of the Lamb. We, we've kind of come to um, the end there. And so what we're going to do is... Uh,
we're going to wait and go into the sixth seal and the seventh seal. I think we can do the sixth and seventh next week. <clears throat> but uh, it's important. And again, when you re when you get this book here, um, it goes through more of the specifics as to why. It says that the robes were given in verse 11. That's the word didomi in the Greek. And it goes through more of a an understanding of you know what it means to be given a white robe as to washing the robe in the blood of the Lamb. <clears throat> um, one of the last verses that I'll bring out here says, uh, There are many who have not considered thus far the degree of commitment that will be needed to survive the perils of the very last days. A lot of Christians have not thought. In fact, the reason why a lot of Christians have not thought about these things is because they've been taught that they're not even going to be here. And that is a deception. God always rescues His people out of tribulation. Not, he, doesn't pres he preserves them through it. Right? He preserves them through the tribulation and then finally comes to their rescue. He doesn't keep them away from it necessarily. A lot of Christians have been taught they're going to be raptured out of here. They're not, they don't even, after Revelation chapter 4, and they don't even worry about any of the other stuff that's in there. Well, they just take away the word great and they put seven year. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, um, people have not that? really <laughs> considered the degree of commitment that's going to be needed to survive the, the, the commitment that God is calling for. He's calling for an exemplary people to vindicate his character. Right? Now, notice what it says here. I'll, I'll leave you with this scripture here. This is in Ephesians chapter 4. It says, And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists. And this is so appropriate um, to see the progression that takes us to the end here. So pastor teachers for the perfecting or the maturing of the saints. That's what's actually happening with the 144,000. They are maturing, right? Which means that they're not falling down and sinning. They're, they're able to walk upright and steady. They're maturing of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying or the building up of the body of Christ till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. All the things that He has done, you see, the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect or mature man, now notice this, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. What is unto the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ? Can we be omnipotent mm -hmm. as human beings? No. Can we be omnipresent? No. Can we be omniscient? Even though some people think they know it all, the answer is no. Okay, we can't be omniscient. So what's this measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ? Christ the man walking a sanctified walk. That's the full measure reflecting his character. That is where the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, takes a willing number of people that are going to live through to the end, to the full measure of the statue of Christ, and they're reflecting his character. The reason this is the reason this is necessary, and the reason this is, I mean it's certainly possible because I can do all things through Christ, Christ who strengthened me, right? Uh, Philippians 4.13. So I can, do, I can do those things through the power of Christ. I, I don't have it inside myself, but I have it in, I have, if, I, if I'm allowing the Spirit, I have to be willing to allow the Spirit to have full control. I have to be willing to submit, to, sub, to be subdued under the power of the Holy Spirit. That's how Christ lived His life. That's how Christ walked in victory day in and day out as a man. He wasn't using His divine abilities. He, he, as a man, He was just utilizing what heaven had made available. That's what this group of people at the end of time do. They utilize it to the point, and of course, now why is this necessary? Why is it absolutely necessary that you have this group of people reflecting the character of Christ, sinners who are not sinning? Okay? Why is that, why is that necessary? Because he has ended, he has ended this mediatorial work. We call that the close of human probation. After probation closes, right, how long is it before Jesus comes? 
there's a time period. There's a period of time between the close of probation and the time that he comes. Okay? Uh, some people believe seven days. Some people believe seven years. Some people believe uh, just uh, 35 days, okay, which that probably seems about the most likely. Uh, I get that from Daniel chapter 12. So, <clears throat> blessed and holy is he who goes to the 1335. At 1290, probation probably be close, but blessed is he, it's 45 days. Blessed, blessed is he who goes to the 1335. Okay? <laughs> so you've got a 45-day period of time there that is introduced in Daniel, the end of Daniel chapter 12. So there are different, different but anyway, but anyway d d depending on what, what you, time you believe it is, there's a period of time between probation closing and the actual showing up of the Messiah a second time. Okay? And so if there's no mediator, if there's no advocate, in, if there's no one pleading your case in the heavenly sanctuary because that ministry has been closed, and you are sealed inside the ark of safety like Noah and his family, Right, you are sinners who are no longer sinning. You're walking a sanctified, spirit-filled life. You're operating totally by grace. That's why it's necessary to reach that point before probation closes. Father, it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but when you appear, we shall be like you, for we shall see you as you are, okay, as he is. So this is the whole reason. There's a, there's, it's not, it's not to, to, it's not a selfish motive. It's not to say, hey, I'm better than other people. You know, I've grown. It's none of that. None of that is involved. It's absolutely necessary so Christ can end his mediation. And come. Okay. Anyway, important stuff. Really important stuff because we're we're getting down to the wire. In terms of the amount of time left in order to make those choices and decisions and commitment. We're getting down to the wire. Okay. All right, so uh, any other thoughts or questions? Only about the sixth seal. Yeah, we'll go into number six and s maybe six and seven next week. So. But uh, how incredible this is. Time, the Messiah has given us time. He's pleading our case. He's working with us. He's mediating on our behalf. Trying to get everything really is designed just to get us ready for the close of human probation. That's what it really is. Okay. Um, and like Marta said, we're just travelers instead of spiritual battlefield. Yeah. Just trying to get home. So anyway, we brought out a lot of scripture today. A lot of things to consider. Um, you might have to go back over and watch the, the uh, stream or the, the archive to get, to get it all. But uh, really important stuff here. Um, time for us to close in prayer. So let me invite you just to pause a second what you're doing. And we'll go ahead and bow our hands for prayer. Father, we want to thank you and praise you for the marvelous plan that you put in motion uh, <clears throat> 6,000 years ago when it was necessary, when Adam and Eve fell. Your plan began. And for several thousand years now, uh, you, you've been working through all the aspects of things that you needed to do. You've been unloosening all those seals and accomplishing for us um, a plan, of, a rescue plan of salvation that is just so unbelievable. We pray, Lord, that through your grace, we will respect you and honor you and vindicate your character and grow to the place that you need us to be so that you can end your mediation and finally come to take us home, to put this nightmare of sin in the past. We long, Lord, for that resolution, and we pray that you'll accomplish it through us and in us. Meet with all those who couldn't be here today. We pray for all those who are watching uh, the message on the Internet. And we ask, Lord, that you would prepare us, that you, we would be like Gideon's 300. Uh, and then we would go into battle with the torch and the trumpet. <clears throat> and we would let your light shine in all the world. And we would sound the message of, of uh, repentance and redemption far and wide. So guide and direct us and prepare us to that end. In Jesus' name we pray. And we pray a blessing as always 
on the food that you've provided, on the fellowship time that we have together. May we just uh, relish in the joy of your Sabbath rest. And we ask these blessings in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen and amen. Okay, so thanks guys for your comments, questions, for your time. I want to thank you for joining us again, once again. And we'll be here, same place, same time, next week. Homechurch.us. You guys have a great week.